What's a knot? Well, that's a knot, and that's a bigger knot, and that's a really complex knot. Basically, each of us has had to deal with knots, mostly causing some anger. However, when it comes to the mathematicians, knots are useful rather than frustrating. For instance, knots can help us from solving mathematical puzzles to modeling DNA and studying the effects of enzymes on it. In this video, I will present the basics of knot theory so that we can solve an interesting puzzle which is, in my opinion, what makes this video special. But before we start, I want to tell you that my name is Stefan Voicilo. I am a high school student from Romania, passionate about maths and computer science. This is my submission for the Summer of Math Exposition and I really hope that you will enjoy my video. Without any further ado, let's get into it. A formal definition of a mathematical knot is the next one. A knot is an embedding of a circle in three-dimensional space. In other words, a mathematical knot is almost the same as the regular ones, so what we usually call a knot, except that its ends are tied together, not allowing the rope to return at the initial position. In order to keep it simple, in this video I will represent knots using knot diagrams. A knot diagram is a projection of a particular knot onto a plane. With that being said, this is the simplest knot, also called the unknot. We say that the unknot is the simplest knot because it has no crossings. We'll call a crossing to be the point of a so-called self-intersection of the rope. Now, every knot has a crossing number which represents the minimum number of crossings from every possible arrangement. Take the trefoils for example. Their crossing number is 3 and they are the simplest non-trivial knots. Of course, there are knots infinitely more complex than the trefoils. However, there are some cases where a knot can be transformed into an equivalent knot with less crossings. The transformations we are allowed to make are the so-called Rydermeister moves. The three moves are the twist, the poke, and the slide. A well-known equivalence is the one between the culprit knot and the R knot. At first glance, the culprit knot seems to be very complicated, but after some ride the master moves, it becomes the R knot. So we obtain the R knot, but what ride the master move did we use for each transformation? I've given you the answer for three of them. Pause the video and see if you can spot the right might moves we made for the remaining transformations. As a fun fact, back in 1954, no systematic method was known by which one can tell whether two knots are the same or different. However, in 2021, Oxford mathematician Mark Lackenby has created an algorithm that determines whether a knot is the knot in n to the power of c log n steps for some constant c, which is known as quasi-polynomial time. For example, these two tangled diagrams are both actually the knot. Moving on, now we will talk about links between knots. A link is a collection of knots which do not intersect but which may be linked together. The simplest non-trivial example of a link with more than one component is called the Hopf link which consists of two unknots linked together at once. Now I will present you two special links which will help us solve our puzzle. The Borromean rings and the Brunian links. The circles in the Borromean rings are collectively linked despite the fact that no two of them are directly linked. Most commonly these rings are drawn as circles in the plane like a Venn diagram as shown. Another well-known link in knot theory is the Brunian link. A Brunian link is a non-trivial link that becomes a set of trivial unlinked circles if any one component is removed. The Borromean rings represent the simplest possible Brunian link. Here are more examples of Brunian links consisting of three loops which differ in the number of crossings. And now, with all the accumulated knowledge about knot theory, we should be able to solve our puzzle which asks us the next question. How can you hang a picture using a string looped around two nails, such that removing any of the two nails causes the picture to fall? As we will see, the puzzle can be generalized. Instead of having a total of two nails, we could have n, and instead of removing only one nail, we could remove exactly k so that the picture falls. In this video, I am going to present the base case and then the first generalization. 
Let's start thinking how we could solve the basic puzzle. This is how we would normally hang a picture if we had two nails. Unfortunately, the picture does not fall if we remove one nail. We have two nails and removing any of them leads to the falling of the picture. In other words, removing one of the nails falls the picture and the remaining knot and the rope are unlinked. Doesn't it sound similar to something we've discussed before? Well, yes. Think about Borromean rings, three linked loops with the next property. No matter which one you remove, the remaining loops are unlinked. Now, we have to ask ourselves the following question. How can we make use of the Borromean rings to solve our puzzle? Here's the answer. By stretching one loop to bring a point to infinity and straightening out the loop, we will have a line rather than a ring. And this line represents one nail in our original puzzle. Consequently, if we perform this transformation two times, we will obtain two nails and the remaining Borromean ring will be nothing but the string looped around the nails. Hence, we have our puzzle done. Conversely, any solution to the two nail puzzle can be transformed into a Borromean ring construction by viewing the nails as infinite lines piercing the loop of rope and converting these lines to large loops. Ok, but what's the answer? Well, this is a possible answer for the two nail puzzle. You could imagine what happens if we remove one nail. Although you may agree that this is a valid solution, I thought it would be advisable to prove this by making a real life video. So here it is. But we are mathematicians and we can't stop here, right? We should be able to find the generalization. What if we have n nails? Can we use a Borromean link like we did for the two nail puzzle? Not at all, and here's why. A Borromean link would consist of n loops that are non-trivially linked and no two of the loops are linked. This doesn't help since we wouldn't be sure of the picture falling unless we remove n-2 nails. The result, whether the picture falls or not, is still unclear if we remove between 1 and n-3 nails, depending on the chosen Borromean link. Fortunately, we can handle it. Can you guess what notion presented today would be useful? Brunian links Recall that a Brunian link is a non-trivial link that becomes a set of trivial unlinked circles if any one component is removed. This is exactly what we are looking for. Removing any nail leads to the falling of the picture. Now, just like before, we have to tackle the next issue. How do we get the answer to our puzzle using Brunian links? Think about what we have done previously to solve the two nail puzzle. We started from three rings, transformed two of them into nails and got the desired result. Can we do something similar? Absolutely. Starting from a Brunian N link, we can transform N minus one of the loops into nails, and the remaining one will be the rope looped around the nails. Let's see the answer for the three nail puzzle. And here is the proof that the solution we obtained is correct. When Brun studied these special links, he gave a construction for every N greater than two. That means we have an answer for the n nail puzzle for any n natural number greater or equal to 2. The bad part is the combinatorial complexity of this solution because the size of it grows exponentially with n. For example, here is how a Brunian 6 link would look. Compare it to a Brunian 4 link. It is clear that we can apply the same procedure to solve our puzzle, but think how complicated the solution would be as n grows. We don't want that at all. Still, we can find a better solution in terms of complexity. In order to find a more efficient solution, we will make use of free groups. But what's a free group? I have attached a rigorous definition from Wikipedia. Pause the video and read it carefully. Although you have not studied group theory yet, and that definition seems overwhelming, I am sure that I can make you understand this solution. That definition is not as complicated as it looks we will construct what is called a group on n generators. Let S be a set of n symbols, x sub 1, x sub 2, and so on, and we suppose that for every element in S, there is a unique corresponding inverse. Let S inverse be the set of all these inverses, and T the reunion of S and S inverse. We will define a word in S to be any written product of elements of T. For example, x sub 1 x sub 2 x sub 1 inverse x sub 2 inverse is a valid word. Now we have to pay attention to what each symbol represents so that it helps us solve the puzzle. We will use the following notation. 
x sub i will represent wrapping the rope around eth nail clockwise and x sub i inverse will represent wrapping the rope around eth nail counterclockwise. Having established the significance of each symbol, let's see what the word previously given as an example really represents. It is, indeed, the answer for the two-nail puzzle. But before we continue, we have to introduce some terminology. If in a word we have x sub i and x sub i inverse next to each other, it means turning clockwise around the eth nail and then immediately undoing that turn by turning counterclockwise around the same nail. So x sub i and x sub i inverse cancel each other. So all occurrences of x sub i, x sub i inverse and x sub i inverse x sub i can be dropped in order to work with reduced words. If we remove the eth nail, we remove all the occurrences of x sub i and x sub i inverse. The identity word 1 means that the picture falls. Moreover, the identity word is also its own inverse. We will call the length of the hanging as the number of symbols in the word. Now, let's go back to the answer for the two nail puzzle and analyze it a bit more. Let's see what happens if you remove the second nail. Using the newly introduced terminology, we will obtain the identity word, thus the wanted result. I will let you figure out what happens if you remove the first nail. It is very similar. In group theory, the word representing the answer for the two-nail puzzle is called the commutator of x sub 1 and x sub 2 and is written like shown. From now on, we will use this notation since it is a lot shorter. We will also use the algebraic rules added on the screen. With this free group representation, we can generalize our puzzle and find an answer for the n-nail puzzle using induction. We already know the answer when n is 2 and we want to build a solution for the 3-nail puzzle. We will do this by writing s sub 3 in terms of s sub 2 and x sub 3 like this. The red colored inverse can be calculated using the algebraic rules mentioned before. It goes without saying that the rules will lead to a correct result, but I wanted to tell you that, in our case, it is also pretty straightforward to guess the inverse. You just look for the right symbols so that when they are put next to the initial word, they cancel. We obtained a potential answer. To be sure that this is a correct one, we must verify if the picture falls after removing either nail. Let's check what happens if we remove the third nail. We remain with S sub 2 and S sub 2 inverse. The cancellation is pretty clear and after we substitute S sub 2, the low level cancellation in terms of X sub 1 and X sub 2 is explicit. Now, if we remove one of the first two nails, we already know that S sub 2 becomes the identity word. Then, the result is clear. In conclusion, we obtained the correct answer for S sub 3. I encourage you to compute S sub 4 and check if it is a valid answer using the same method. With the pattern we have just used, it is clear that we can build a solution recursively using S sub n minus 1 and X sub n for the n nail puzzle. Afterwards, we can verify that the picture falls whether we remove the one of the first n minus 1 nails or the nth nail. Despite the fact that we found a way to generate a solution for every n, we still have a problem. The length of s sub n grows exponentially with n, just like at the solution which uses not theory. We will prove that the length of s sub n is 2 to the n plus 2 to the n minus 1 minus 2. First, we check the base case when n is equal to 2. Supposing inductively that s sub n minus 1 has a length of 2 to the n minus 1 plus 2 to the n minus 2 minus 2, we can easily find the length of s sub n. So we proved what we wanted. Note that we use the fact that the inverse of a word has the same length as the word itself. Fortunately, using free groups, there is a polynomial construction that solves our puzzle. Obviously, it is a lot more efficient. 
This time we will not write s sub n in terms of s sub n minus 1. Instead, we will build s sub n recursively using the first half of the nails and the second one. In order to do so, we will use the notation shown on the screen, which I will read as e from i through j to consider all the nails from i through j for various i and j. We know that e from i through i is x sub i and e from i through i plus 1 is the commutator of x sub i and x sub i plus 1. And this is how we build e from i through j out of a recursive copy of e applied to the first half of the interval and a recursive copy of e applied to the second half of the interval. Let's calculate e when i is equal to 1 and j is equal to 4. So we obtain the sequence of length 16. Previously, the length of the answer for the four nail puzzle was 22. This saving becomes even more significant as n grows. For instance, if n is a power of 2, we will prove inductively that e from 1 through n has a length of n squared. We have already verified that for n equal to 4, the length being 16. e from 1 through n consists of two copies of e from 1 through n over 2 and two copies of e from n over 2 plus 1 through n. Since these intervals have a length of n over 2, from the induction hypothesis it means that applying e to both of them results in a sequence of length n over 2 squared. We can also prove that x sub i and x sub i inverse appear exactly n times. Let's check it for n equals 4. Now let's prove the general case. x sub i can appear whether in e applied to the first half of the interval or in e applied to the second half of the interval since they do not intersect. Inductively, x sub i appears n over 2 times in one of these halves, which leads us to the conclusion. If n is not a power of 2, then there is a number a such that n is between 2 to a and 2 to a plus 1. It means that n can be written as 2 to a plus b. Of course, b is less than 2 to a. In Neil Sloan's encyclopedia, it was found a formula for the length of e from 1 through n which we will take for granted. It is not difficult to show that the length is less than or equal to 2n squared. See if you can prove this last inequality by yourself. To calculate the number of appearances of x sub i and x sub i inverse, we will use that e from 1 through n is built using multiple recursions which double the appearances of each symbol. In addition to that, because every recursion splits the interval into two intervals with the same length, we have at most log base 2 of n plus 1 recursions. Now we can easily calculate the number of appearances for each symbol. In conclusion, we finally obtained an efficient answer for the NL puzzle, thus achieving our goal. Despite the fact that this video is not a collaboration, I still want to give a special thanks to Luca Pano who kindly shared his non theory knowledge when I told him what the video was going to be about and also to Alexandru Dan who helped me by converting some photos into PNGs and also editing them a bit. I am very grateful for their help since I managed to save some precious time. And last but not least, thank you for staying until the end of my video. I truly appreciate it. If you have a question, put it in the comments and I will try to answer it. Furthermore, I have attached in the video description a document with all the resources I used to make this video. Bye bye and once again thank you.